Members, I'd like to call the Jobs and Economic Development slash Growth Committee to order. Um, today is Wednesday, February 1st, uh, and, and it's my understanding that we have a quorum with those who have checked in uh, and so on and so forth. So a quorum is present. Today we will have a presentation from our state, de state demographer as well as we'll listen to Senate File 400 and Senate File 559 as well as Senate File 325. My thoughts are when we listen to those Senate files, we will lay those over for possible inclusion in the overarching bill, but it'd be important for us to hear testimony and uh, get a sense of what those bills are all about and what the, what the request is. What I thought would be important is for us to start off with our uh, state demographer, because I think it's important to put context to some of the work that we're doing so we know why are we doing this work? What are we trying to um, uh, address and or solve or make meaningful progress around? So Ms. Brower, uh, if you'd be so kind as to approach the testifier's table. Uh, and once you are prepared, you can begin your presentation. But while you're getting set up, members also feel free to ask questions. Uh, that would be, you know, really appropriate because I want to make sure that you understand the information. And I think, members, that you should have the, the bills in your packet um, as well as um, the uh, demographer's uh, uh, um, handout as well, right? So with that being stated, Ms. Brower, please uh, uh, start your testimony with any opening statements that you have, and we can go from there. So thank you so much for being here. It's always so good to see you, and if you need any help, we can make sure that... Uh, uh, someone can come and be of assistance to you. Thank you, Chair Champion and uh, members of the committee. My name is Susan Brower. I'm the state demographer, and I work in the Department of Administration. I'm sorry, I don't And know. the only thing I ask, uh, uh, Ms. Brower, is that you sort of speak so close to that mic because you have a wonderful, soft voice, but we want to hear every great <laughs> thing that you have to say. I am getting over a bit of a cold, so you'll forgive me for having my accoutrement with me. <laughs> Still coming. So uh, can one of the folks help with getting the slides up, please? There, there we go. go. I'm stoked. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Nope. It's coming. <laughs> okay. Let me know when you're ready. There we go. So I have been asked today to share information about Minnesota's labor force, including projections for the future. I've also been asked to speak about racial and ethnic diversity of the labor force and to share some of the recent trends that we have in employment, labor force participation, and changes in wages of Minnesota workers. So I'll start with a picture of labor force growth and what we're projecting for the future. Oh, look, you can read along with me there. Hang on. <laughs> Hang along with, um, I'm not sure if someone can help me out. I'm seeing my, my uh, presentation view here on my slide. I think it's flipped. <laughs> Do whatever you need to do. Well, you have the slides. I'll get going. Um, thank you for your help. Um, what we're looking at um, on the first graph that you see is a projection of labor force growth and past labor force growth. And what you can see from 1970 to about 2010 is Minnesota's workforce was growing remarkably well. We and, and if we'll pause a second, we have a member who is viewing this online, and he's and Senator Pratt indicated that he cannot hear the testimony or see the, oh the grass, but now 
we have him up so hopefully he can hear everything. So proceed forward, and if I hear something, I'll let you know. Thank you. Well, thank you. We'll just move ahead with, with the view that we have here. That works fine for me, if that works for you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So what we're seeing here is the working, go ahead and do what you need to do. Oh, they're not able to see it. They're not able to see it. Yeah. Let me give you a flash drive. Thanks, everyone, for your patience, but we're going to get it right. <laughs> Thanks. And I will keep walking through that first slide as, as we go, if that's all right, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Ms. Brower. Thank you. So we've had remarkable workforce growth in the past several decades. Employers didn't really even know it. We didn't really even know that it was remarkable. It was just normal to us. And what we have experienced in the last decade and what we anticipate into the foreseeable future is a stalling out of that growth as the baby boomers retire and as we have fewer young people moving into the working uh, age years. Um, the baby boomers now have reached retirement ages. We're about halfway through the transition of retirements of that huge generation over that 65-year-old age mark. Um, but we still have another 10 years to go with the younger baby boomers moving into retirement. So um, we're anticipating into the foreseeable future that we won't see much growth in the workforce. The number of workers that we have today is very close to the number of workers that we will have in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, if not for changes uh, in migration or in birth rates, both of which would be a, a pretty big turnaround of events. The more likely scenario is that going forward we will have close to the same number of workers today that we have uh, in 10 and 20 years. This appears to be a, a presentation from another <laughs> committee. <laughs> so <laughs> there's one that's labeled Senate Jobs and Economic Development. Chair. You can see there's some overlap, though. <laughs> uh, if you hold on a second, there's a question, uh, Senator Draham. Thank you. If, if uh, turn on your mic, Senator Draham. <laughs> I think it's on. Okay. Much better. Okay, thank you. Um, on on your second slide, on the Lake Forest or labor force growth and concentration in the Twin Cities Metro, hmm. you know when you look at the the first graph, which I think you have labeled three, it looks pretty flat, and then you look at the change in that second graph with, of course, most of the working age people being in the metro up till this last decade, and then it's shrinking about 100,000 or 95,000. Um, I, I, I don't see where the difference is really there in the other, other zones or regions compared to what you show as pretty much a flat, um, consistent, Population. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit for us? Ms. Brower. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, um, it may not appear to be there, uh, but it's from the da same data set. And so I know kind of visually it doesn't look like it quite makes up for that growth in the Twin Cities metro and moving forward. Uh, but they're from the very same numbers that tie together, and I'm happy to provide that data table for, for additional context. What I will say is our projections, as you've um, looked at here now uh, by economic development region, is the concentrated growth that we have seen in the last decade, those are the gray bars, is in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. That's where the population growth has been. And uh, moving forward, we're looking just at those blue bars. That's the projection for the future 2020 to 2030. So that corresponds on the first graph to 2020 to 2030, where, yes, as you noted, it's nearly flat. Um, the, the following graphic that we have um, takes out the Twin Cities metropolitan area. 
If we go one more, um, it takes out the Twin Cities metro. Oop. There we go. Um, and we can look just at the greater Minnesota regions and their change without kind of swamping it with the size of the Twin Cities metro area. And I think what stands out there is the growth that is happening in workforce uh, that we project uh, is happening around the St. Cloud area. It's almost flat in some of the other metro regions. Uh, for example, we have the uh, West Central where Moorhead is located. We have Southeast where the Rochester metro is located. You see a leveling off, maybe a very small amount of growth. But in general, what we're talking about are uh, a contraction of the working age population in those areas rather than the flat as we see for the state overall. So we've looked at uh, the projected number of people in the state who are of working age. We see that there's not going to be a lot of growth anytime soon. I now want to put those projections in context uh, for the demand that we currently have for workers. Um, so we're looking here uh, at a historical series of data of job openings uh, over time. Those are the blue bars on this graphic. And the kind of mountainous region behind there are the number of unemployed people that we have at the same time. And you can see for most of this series, we have more unemployed people than we have job openings. Right before the pandemic, we started to see job shortages open up. We saw more job openings or job vacancies than we had um, unemployed workers or people actively looking for work. That kind of steeple or peak that you see uh, is the disruptions caused by the pandemic. Um, but again, after the pandemic, we've returned to a period with a high number of vacancies, more than 200,000 on average over the last year in 2022, um, and, and just about 68,000 unemployed people. So a very, very tight uh, labor market. Um, I'm showing this just to give you a context for the labor force growth that I just talked about. Mr. And, Chair. And Senator, uh, um, Senator Pratt has a question. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I think it's been answered, but I just wanted to uh, uh, clarify. When we're talking about unemployed, we're talking about those, uh, again, that are in the work, that are technically classified in the workforce and not those that have have given up and left the workforce, correct? Ms. Mr. Brower. Chair, uh, Senator, yes, that's correct. These are people who are actively looking for work who are considered in the labor force and unemployed. And Mr. Chair, if I could ask a follow-up. Senator Press, certainly. Thank you. Uh, uh, wondering if um, we have that information about those that would technically qualify as uh, working age that would be counted in labor force participation that uh, could be added on top of that number because I know we're still somewhere between 75 and 95,000 people short uh, in the labor force compared to where we were pre-February of 2020. Uh, Ms. Bauer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, it always gives me great joy when I'm asked a question for which I have a visual <laughs> that's just next, just around the corner. So. <laughs> If Thank you're you willing, I, get, I, I would love to show you those numbers. I do have a graphic showing the number of people who are not in the workforce uh, and to kind of give you a sense of who those people might be. All right, Ms. Brower, because I think I, someone told me I said Bauer, so I want to make sure I get it right. Brower. <laughs> I know who you were talking about. It's just mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> Uh, so in the next slide, I show you the number of people who are not in the workforce. Um, and uh, these are not the people who are considered unemployed. They're not actively looking for work. I've, uh, we don't have information specifically about why they're not working. They're not asked that directly in this survey. But we have other information that can kind of give us some clues for what else they might have going on in their lives. So we're looking by age at 16 to 64 year olds. These are all the people who are not in the workforce. And in total, those people equal about 650,000. Uh, there are about 187,000 who are in high school or post-secondary school. That's shown in the gray, the light gray portion of this bar. 
Um, it doesn't mean that they can't also be working, of course, but I'm, I'm just giving this as context for other things that they've got going on in their lives. Certainly, um, many of our 16 to, to 17 or 18 year olds are still in high school. An estimated 104,000 of these in the dark blue portion are retired. 21,000 are in institutions. Uh, this is of all ages, the 21,000. So whether it's a correctional institution, a nursing home, some other kind of healthcare uh, institution or facility. And 12,000 are in group quarters that may be for people with disabilities or, or other types of group quarters. Again, this doesn't mean that these folks cannot work. Uh, they may choose to work. They may have the ability to work. Uh, but it kind of gives you a sense that we begin narrowing down this pool of available workers. If we take out those groups that I just talked about, we get down to about 326,000 people left. And then we think of the other scenarios for which uh, people may be out of the workforce. So whether they're caring for young children, uh, caring for um, other people in their lives, whether they have a disability or other kind of health issue. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, Demographer Brower, to this slide, uh, who is not in the workforce? Incredibly important question. And there's one group that's not on here, and I did want to ask you about that, what type of information you might have about those people. And that's about the 20,000 people, I believe, who left our state. Um, do we have any information uh, from, I know several years ago, back in uh, the 13 or 14, there was a survey done, to, done um, for people who left our state, who ch those who chose to reply, of course, why they left the state. Do, we ha do you have anything like that about uh, today? The, the folks that aren't in the workforce because, well, they're just not here anymore. And uh, Ms. Brower, and, and if you could add on to that, um, uh, of that 20,000, what's the age range? Are those like um, uh, snowbirds and others who decided that they no longer wanted to be here, therefore they, wouldn't, they would be a part of the gray tsunami so they wouldn't be necessarily in the workforce? So, uh, so I think that would be helpful if you have any information uh, around that. Thank you. Ms. Brower. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, we do have information about people who have left the state recently. Um, the vast majority of the people who le have left in the last year and, and in any given year are in their teens, late teens, early 20s, and most of them are enrolled in post-secondary school a year later. So most of the movement, the vast majority of movement is happening to go to college in another state. There are also many people who move to Minnesota to, to do that, but when we're talking about net losses of people to other states, um, most of the, the losses are, are of people who are going to school elsewhere. Mr. Chair. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that is an important piece to, to drill down, and just to, off on an aside, that is a troubling trend, because we know, at least the last I read, about 85% of kids who go off to college end up staying in the state where they're in higher ed. So this could be a, a, a dangerous a predictor for us. We want more of those young people in our state. Uh, I would be interested in if you could follow up with any of that information regarding folks who have left. We hear a lot of anecdotes. People left because their Social Security is being taxed or because uh, there's no sales tax in a particular state or it's just a lower tax state or or the climate There's some things we can't do anything about like the warmer weather But it would be helpful if you might be able to share any of that information that you have with us. Thank you Ms. Brower, do you have anything you can say about it now or you will give us additional information later? What what are you thinking? Uh, Mr. Chair, I and Senator, I, I don't um, have anything additional other than to say generally that it's young people and people going to college that make up the most of it, but I certainly can share those numbers with you so that you can see them yourselves and kind of get a sense for age groups and so forth. Oh, Mr. Chair, one uh, last question. Let's follow up. Senator yeah. Nelson. Well, it, does your department have any way uh, of actually doing that uh, in a broader sense uh, when people leave our state, they exit our state, to know why are they leaving our state? I know on a smaller scale, you know, our school districts do that. When, when people leave the school district, 
they ask, well, why? Um, so when people leave our state, would your uh, department uh, be the area where we might be able to collect some of that information? Uh, Ms. Brower. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, it certainly would be possible. Uh, we rely primarily on census surveys uh, to give us this information so they're not directly asking why someone made a move. Uh, so we kind of have to glean that from whatever they're doing once they land in wherever, whatever state they've moved from using the census data. Sure, it's possible to uh, create a survey like that. Uh, it may be expensive to do that kind of sampling and follow up, but uh, you know, it's something worth exploring, certainly. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Last thing, I would just say that... Senator um, Nelson. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Minnesota uh, Business Journal, several years ago, after, ac actually, I think it was precipitated because there was a $2 billion tax hike, and they wanted to see how that was affecting Minnesotans. They did do that study, uh, and they line-itemed out, you know, what percent of people left for this reason, what percent of people left for that reason. I think that is a good thing. Maybe if it's not your <laughs> department, uh, but I, I think that's important for us to know. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So to that, and then I'll go to the other senators that have, that have a question, um, especially thinking in terms of the young people who are leaving to go to college and, and those who tend to stay or go someplace else, then we need to think deeply about what can we do in order to attract them to come back to Minnesota and, and, and continue to uh, make valuable contributions to us. I have that thinking about my two sons who are going to be graduating from college soon. So uh, with that, si si Senator, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You guys okay? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Brower, uh, my understanding is that the state of Minnesota has negative migration of college students to every community we border politically. Sometimes it's up to 10 to 15% more students go to North Dakota or Wisconsin or Iowa, even Canada, uh, uh, that we have uh, negative migration when it comes to college students, um, uh, which supports what you were just saying about the, the age of the population that's leaving. Uh, Senator Greg, former Senator Greg Clausen once told me that uh, there are twice as many people who are 18 to 22 leaving the state than those over 60. Um, is that true or was he lying to me? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Brower. Mr. Chair, Senator, absolutely. I would even say it's probably a higher factor than twice as many. Um, and I wish I had that graphic here to share with you. I will certainly follow up with it. A very small minority of older adults leave the state each year in comparison to the number of young people who are leaving. And most of them are, are, as I said, due to college migration. Follow up, Senator Putnam. Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Mr. Chair, I just accidentally left my hand up for my last question. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want you to know that my wonderful committee administrator wanted to really make sure that you had a chance to say something, Senator Pratt. No. Um, uh, I'm going down to. Uh, Oh, that's it. Back to uh, Ms. Brower. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to turn now and look at some other demographic dimensions of our current workforce, in particular, in particular the uh, growing number of uh, racially and ethnically diverse Minnesota workers. Uh, you can see from this graph that less of about 2% of Minnesota workers in 1970 belonged to a BIPOC, black, indigenous, people of color, racial or ethnic group. Now that percentage is about 23%. So that growth has happened over time. And in particular, in the most recent period, you can see between 2010 and 2021 that the growth of uh, white workers has reversed. Now we have a shrinking number of white workers as the uh, baby boomers who are largely white non-Hispanic are retiring and a more diverse younger generation is moving in to make up those uh, working age years. Um, so this uh, diversity of our workforce will continue to unfold into the future. As we can see on the next uh, slide, um, we see our age structure in Minnesota uh, by race and ethnicity, broad groups, white non-Hispanic is shown in blue, gray is showing you uh, BIPOC populations. And what's important to note here is that as we get younger, we get more and more diverse. And this kind of cooks in the momentum 
toward greater diversity for our state moving forward, regardless of what happens with immigration into the future, our state will continue to become more diverse because our younger people are more diverse. They will move into the parenting ages um, and have more diverse uh, babies. And so that's cooked into who we are, the people who are living here now, is this movement, the steady movement toward greater racial and ethnic diversity just because of our age structure of the people who are living here today. In the final series of slides, I'm going to cover how labor force participation, unemployment, and full-time and part-time work have changed over the past decades for workers belonging to different race groups. To do this, I use census data from the American Community Survey, which is an enormous household survey, and it's the very best data that we have for allowing us to look at details between workers in different race groups. So you may have seen more up-to-date information uh, comparing race groups over time, but this is the source of information that really gives us a clear picture of what has happened over the last decade or so, and that's what I'm gonna share with you today. I wanna warn you that there is a lot of information in the following graph, so buckle up, but if we can look at these graphs like they're a dashboard and not worry, well, I'm happy to answer any question, but not worry about any single data point, generally try to get a sense of the movement over time and across race groups. That's, that's what I'm going for here with this next set of slides. This is the information I'm trying to convey. So exam for example, we're looking here at labor force participation changes across race groups in Minnesota. Each section across the bottom represents a different race group and each bar represents a different year beginning with 2010 on the left and going through 2021 on the right. 2020 is missing in each of the graphs that I'll share with you up here and that's because the Census Bureau had problems with collecting data during the pandemic and so those data aren't published. Um, so where you see a gap, that's why. Um, the big picture that we're looking at in terms of labor force participation and how it has changed over the last decade, um, you can see that for most BIPOC workers, we have seen a steady increase in labor force participation over the past decade. The trend is especially pronounced for Asian, Latino, and black workers, less so for American Indian workers, but the population is quite small, and so it's harder to get a clear trend with, with a smaller population. We see for black and white uh, workers that there was a reduction in labor force part participation in the 2021, the most recent data point. Um, that includes the full calendar year, so it would include pretty early on in the pandemic, January through, you know, with January through whatever, June of 2021, where there were still major disruptions uh, brought on because, because of the pandemic. So some of what we're seeing, we're not seeing the full recovery from that. So I just want you to keep in mind when you're looking at those 2021 numbers that it, uh, it, it is quite close to the pandemic and is capturing some of those disruptions. That hopefully when we get the 2022 data later this year, uh, we will see uh, a recovery from that. We have seen them in other indicators that are more recent. Looking across the different groups, uh, we still see disparities, uh, different levels of labor force participation uh, at the end of the decade, especially for black and American Indian workers. Um, there's still work to do, but in general, these trends really have been moving in the right direction over the last 10 years. Turning to unemployment uh, by race, we can see steep and steady declines in unemployment over the past decade for all race groups through 2019. And this is on the next slide. Uh, 2021 again represents a setback in that downward trend, but for black workers especially, um, unemployment uh, dropped considerably over the course of the decade as you can see. It returned to 11% in 2021, but you can see that that's um, discontinuous with what the trend had been up till that point. Other research looking at the impact of the pandemic on different race groups, on different um, uh, 
uh, educational levels of, of workers have noted that um, the pandemic was especially disruptive to lower skill workers and to workers of color. And so these num numbers that we're looking at here are consistent with, with that research. Um, again, differences remain at the end of the decade or the beginning, um, you know, even before the 2021 data point. But I think it is remarkable to see these changes that have occurred, the steady gains that were made for all workers, but especially the gains that were made for workers of color during this time. I don't always get to tell good news. I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> um, finally, uh, the last two slides, I just want to give you a sense of whether workers are moving into full-time work or part-time work over the last decade, what we have seen in terms of that. Um, so again, these charts are arranged to give you a general impression of how work status has changed for workers across groups. And I mean whether a worker is full-time or part-time. Full-time work is on the left. Other is, it means it's either part-time or it's seasonal. Um, it's kind of a catch-all phrase for working less than 35 hours or less than 50 hours in a week. Um, this entire set of slides here shows only men. We'll look at women in just a moment. Uh, but I first want to just focus on the left-hand side of each of these and look at the uh, growth of full-time year-round work. Um, for nearly every race group, we see a steady market increase in the number of people with full-time year-round employment over the course of the decade. So that's a, a pretty steady increase. The change is especially pronounced for black men, Asian men, and Hispanic men. It's there for American Indian men as well, although the survey estimates, as I said, bounce around a bit because of the smaller size of that group. Um, growth in full-time work is apparent for my, white men as well, but the rate of change is, is more modest. If we turn now and look at the other side, the other groups, part-time and seasonal work, we can see that for some race groups, part-time employment grew for men, for black, Asian, and Hispanic men, for example, uh, but it grew much more slowly than full-time work did. For other race groups, during this period, there was a steady decline, American Indian and white uh, workers in particular, in part-time work. Uh, in this survey, respondents report their primary job. So if they hold multiple jobs, we're looking only at what they consider to be their primary job. Uh, again, 2021 stands out in uh, terms of kind of a stalling of the trends that we saw over the course of the, the decade. Uh, we see a, an uptick in part-time work in 2021 for many BIPOC workers and a decline in or a stabilization of growth in full-time work during that year. This is the employment picture for men. We can look at the same picture for women. Um, and you can see here some of the same trends. We see slightly different patterns, but if we focus on full-time work on the left part of the box, we can see steady growth in full-time work for black, white, Asian, and Hispanic women. Uh, the trend may be there for American uh, Indian women as well, at least through 2019, but again, the trends are more difficult to read there. To the right of the graph, looking at part-time work, um, you can see marked increases in part-time work for both black women and Hispanic women. Steady but smaller increases for Asian women in part-time work, and for white women, we see a decline in part-time work. The takeaway here for women and for men is that 2010 to 2019 really ushered in considerable growth in full-time employment for all race groups. The gains were especially pronounced in the later part of the decade uh, before the pandemic hit. Um, and this was true for, for uh, BIPOC workers, uh, men and women alike. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have just a, a couple of more slides left, Mr. Chair, but I want to be mindful of time. Would you like me to continue or? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
So up until this point, I've shared the employment picture by race without talking about uh, earnings. I'm going to show you a couple of slides, and then I'll be done um, to help fill in some details about how earnings have changed for different race groups over the last decade. Here we're looking at BIPOC full-time workers, both male and female together this time, and we're looking at the number of workers in each race group who are making more than $58,000 annually. I chose 58,000 for this threshold because it's the median for full-time workers in general, uh, full-time year-round workers for all Minnesota workers. Um, for Asian, black, and Hispanic workers, we have seen growth in the decade in the number of workers with higher earnings above the median wage, above that 58,000. For American Indian workers, the trend isn't as clear. We don't see that clear pattern of growth. And I'm not showing uh, white workers here, but I certainly can provide that information. I just didn't include it because it was hard to see this trend if I included it. Um, but what happened there is that there was growth in that group as well. This tells us that there are more full-time workers, there are more BIPOC workers who are working full-time and are in these higher wage groups. However, if we look at the full range of earnings, uh, one way we can do that is by looking at the median. Um, and this is intended to capture kind of a bigger picture of all workers, not just what's happening at the upper end. Um, we can see that the changes over the decade are more mixed. It's not quite as clear that we see that all workers within a race group have shared in that growth that I was just describing. For American Indian, white, and Hispanic full-time workers, you can see that median wages have increased over time. But for Asian and black full-time workers, we don't see that growth in median earnings. So I just showed you pictures, where or a graphic where we could see growth of higher earnings people. Now I'm showing you a median where nothing really is changing. That's because there was also growth at the lower end, evening out that, that higher end growth. So when we look at the big picture for full-time workers in each of these groups, in particular for black workers uh, and for Asian workers, we're not seeing that same upward trend because we're not just looking at the higher earners. So I wanted to give it to you as kind of full context uh, for all earners in this, in this group. So I think I've shared a fair amount of good news with you after, uh, this afternoon, but there's still uh, work to be done to close gaps in earnings. If we look at the differences, for example, you can see that black and Hispanic workers have median wages, full-time workers have median wages around $40,000 per year compared to that $58,000 for all workers. Um, fortunately for us, uh, opportunities currently abound and the difficult work ahead of us uh, in this decade will be quickly moving people into higher skilled, higher paying jobs. And that ends my prepared remarks, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you just touch on uh, the difference between page 10 when you talk labor force participation and then the rate of labor force on the last slide that you did show there? Um, I think most of the time that there's a number published for participation rate, it's that 68 point whatever, which I think the last slide reflects. And then on slide 10, you know, it's 81%. Can you just touch on that, please? Thank you. Ms. Brower. Mr. Chair, Senator, the difference is that in the first, set, first slide, we're looking at ages 16 to 64. So when you include 16 plus, which is the number that we're much more likely to look at, it drives down the labor force participation rate because you're including people who are 65 and above. I chose in that first graph just to show you 16 to 64 because that tends to be kind of the target audience for people who might be the target pool of people who might be working and to kind of give you a sense that people who are of that prime working age, what that percentage is. But you're right, you can look at it either as 16 plus or as 16 to 64. Follow up, you okay, Senator Draham? I'm never okay, Chair, but... Um, <laughs> 
I, I thought it was reverse. I thought normally when they publish, they always publish the 16 to 64, and, and that isn't the case. Maybe we could have a bill to do that. <laughs> Ms. Brower. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, I've seen it both ways, but I think I'm, I'm more used to seeing the 16 plus to include all workers. Um, it's part of the reason why we have seen what looks like labor force participation rate stall in the more recent period, even though we have all these job opportunities and, and higher wages, it's because we have so many people moving into those older ages where they either are not able to work or have the good fortune to not have to be able to work. Um, and so I've, I've seen it both ways, but it really just depends on, on what your comparisons are and what, what you want to know from the data. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Ms. Browers. A, a quick question. When I looked at slide 15, um, I was kind of curious. Do we have that over the last 12 years, Minnesota's got one of the worst uh, education gaps in the country? And I'm wondering if we have any data that's normalized by level of education. Ms. Brower. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, I don't have those numbers in my head, but absolutely they, uh, those tables exist out there and I'd be happy to provide them. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I'm just concerned that, you know, I, I'd, I'd really like to see because we've you know, you and I have talked many occasions and, and we've worked really, really hard to try to get our students of color uh, on equal par uh, in, in, you know, grade school and high school and, and opportunities to go to post-secondary school. I, I, I think it's really important that we, as, as we look at workforce development, that that be a part of, of the conversation. Thank you so much, Senator Pratt, that is correct. Uh, any other questions for the testifier for Ms. Brower? Last question, and I know that you sort of did it, uh, but just uh, as a way to, s to provide a summation, right? Overall, what does the data tell you and what, uh, what would you want this committee to know and understand as we do our work going forward? Ms. Brower. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for that opportunity. There's a lot of uh, details here. When I think uh, generally about the data that I shared today, um, I think I want people to understand that the picture has improved slowly and steadily for workers of color in the state, but there are still significant differences and significant barriers that are not going away without consistent effort to move the needle in that regard. Um, so I, I hope I provided a balanced picture of that to say, yes, we've seen movement like we, had, like we hoped we would see, uh, but also there's, there's more work to be done and there are uh, kind of more issues to address uh, with respect to racial differences in particular. And, and and I think Senator Nelson had a question, even though I gave you that summation, she's going to uh, now ask another question. <laughs> Senator I Nelson. So, I am so sorry. Here, this is just for another time, but if I could just ask you to uh, put together, well, there's been a lot of discussion about declining enrollment in our schools. And I think one of the pieces that has been missing in that is the declining birth rate. And I, it would be, I, I would very much, not today, of course, but uh, I'd, I'd very much appreciate if you could follow up with, a, uh, I suppose, a 20-year uh, average of birth rate, declining enrollment. I've, I, the last time I saw that probably was about 15 years ago, and I think that's an important piece. So I know you're the person that has the data. Thank you very much. Ms. Brower, anything? Uh, you would just provide that information? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I, uh, if I can ask, uh, Mr. Chair, um, are you talking about enrollment in post-secondary school or in, in uh, grade and high school? I'm or? talking about K-12 school, where K -12. most of our okay. kids are right here in the state. Thank you okay. so much. All right, thank you so much. Ms. Brower, as usual, thank you so very much for taking the time to join us and put together this important information. And I'm certain we certain that we will call on you again. Thanks so, for having me. So thank you so very much. All right, members, thank you so much for engaging uh, our state demographer. 
uh, in that robust discussion. So now we're going to get to our bills. Uh, Senator Fate is going to join us at the testifier's table so he can present uh, Senate File 400, and that is the bill that's in front of us. Senate File 400. And Senator Fate, thank you so much, and welcome to the committee. You thank know, you, give Mr. us some opening statements about the bill itself. Tell us what it's about and why this this important initiative should be something that this committee uh, takes up in order to resource. Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just for the record, my name is Omar Fate, State Senator, District 62. Um, here to talk about SF 400, uh, Minis the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Uh, Teen Teamworks Youth Employment Funding Bill. Um, since 1986, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board has operated the Teen Teamworks program, uh, which has provided quality employment, education, and training programs to around 15,000 economically disadvantaged Minneapolis youth between the ages of 14 and 24. Over the last 30 plus years, Teen Teamworks has received funding through direct state appropriations or competitive grants administered through DEED. This funding is critical in allowing the Minneapolis Park Board to offer this unique and valuable form of youth employment. Increased state funding to support and grow the, the Park Board's youth employment and training programs are critical to their success. The Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board is strategically positioned to offer high quality youth employment and training programs for teens and young adults focused on the outdoors, immersed in parks and nature, with exposure to and a path to green careers. Through the Minneapolis Park Board, Teen Teamworks, uh, the, the youth achieve skills and knowledge through hands-on experience and work, ready, and work readiness training. Youth employed by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board may work in areas such as park maintenance, environmental stewardship, and in gardens, aquatics, and recreation centers. The work experience gained through uh, youth employment with the Park Board is invaluable, and combined with work readiness training, builds a foundation for education and career planning for successful futures. The demand for youth employment and training programs uh, through Minneapolis Park Board continues to grow, but, but state funding has not kept pace. Teen Teamworks relies on increased state funding to expand its youth employment programs. With current state funding of $175,000, the Park Board can employ about 50 youth workers. A direct appropriation from the state of about $750,000, as laid out in SF 400, would allow the Park Board to hire, an addition, to hire 130 youth employees, increase wages, support additional youth worker uh, supervisors, and provide work readiness training. An increase in funding to Teen Teamworks would directly result in an increase in the green career exposure and work training that the Park Board is able to provide to the youth of Minneapolis that are seeking meaningful training and employment options. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll pass it to our first testifier, uh, Mary. Uh, to the first testifier, if you'd be so kind as to state your name for the record and where you're from and go forward with your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Lynn Pulsher, and I'm the Manager for Environmental Education and Youth Employment for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, and I've worked for Minneapolis Parks for forever um, and have been deeply embedded in the work for um, youth in particular. So we're here requesting funding to support youth, and um, just to build on your remarks, is that the kids and the teenagers, young adults that we work with, it runs 85 to 90 percent youth of color. Um, the majority are from disadvantaged backgrounds, and um, we really do a lot of our recruiting out of North Minneapolis and South Central Minneapolis, focusing on green zones and um, RCAP 50s. And it's been a very successful program. And one of the things that we would be looking to do with the additional funding is to provide more opportunities to come back again and again so that we can build that sense of team and build on the skills that they earn each year. Um, learn each year. So um, a lot of our youth are 14 and 15 years old. It's their first job experience, but we want you to come back and continue to create these job career pathways so that you become an eligible, desirable full-time employee with us in the future. Um, one of the things that we're keenly interested in and started a few years ago is the Mississippi River Green Team, which is a partnership that we've done with the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. 
and that is specifically exposing youth to green career pathways. And so they spend a lot of time doing conservation work. They get to work alongside people who have careers, arborists, range, um, park rangers, um, people who work in architecture, landscape architecture, to expose them to all the possibilities of what's out there. And um, our long-term goal is, of course, to diversify the environmental workforce. And I'm going to let you hear from someone who has um, now in the workforce full-time as a result of starting in our program. We also have um, this funding would allow us to expand programs such as the Indigenous Architecture Crew that we piloted two years ago where um, teens learned about indigenous um, building techniques, um, shelter building. Um, they built a structure out at J.D. Rivers Children's Garden. Um, it allows us to expand the number of youth who can be engaged in our power crews, which is really learning how to use power tools and moving you towards those jobs that are labor jobs, but you've actually had the exposure to you know, weed whips, um, backpack blowers, moving into mowing and those kinds of things, and trying to also inspire kids to um, move into education if it's tech school or we have positions within the park board as seasonals where if you get your GED and a driver's license because that's really key we also have jobs available for you and we are actively looking to fill those jobs we continuously have gaps and are searching for that so um, we're excited to have additional funding and make something happen and I'm going to turn this over to Mary Yang who was um, she started working for us in the Mississippi River Green team when she was 14 and I will turn it over to her. All right, welcome, Mary Yang. Uh, if you would say your name for the record and go forward with your testimony. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mary Yang, and I'm the community outreach specialist at the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. I am here on behalf of the MWMO and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board today to testify in support of Senate File 400. My experience as a participant in youth employment programming at the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board had a positive, lasting impact on my life and led directly to my career. Starting at 15, I was part of the youth employment program called the Mississippi River Green Team. It is a two-year program run by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the MWMO that has changed my life and continued to fuel my passion for working in conservation. My time on the Green Team provided me with a mentor job experience from which I gained valuable knowledge and skills. Working on the green team involves things like maintaining rain gardens, learning plant identification skills, and practicing weed control. This program taught me not only field skills, but also interpersonal skills, such as teamwork, leadership, communication, and responsibility. As part of the program, my supervisor slash mentor continued to help me throughout college. I worked for different agencies like the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the City of Minneapolis Public Works Department, and the Minneapolis Park Board. I graduated from Augsburg University where I majored in urban studies with a double minor in environmental science and sociology. My journey didn't end there. However, I am happy to report that today I am now working in the place where my journey began as a permanent full-time member of the MWMO. I, I wanted to share my story not only to encourage BIPOC youth, youth who wants to start their own journey in conservation, but to ask for your support, your help in supporting them. By funding this youth employment bill, we can continue to educate and help BIPOC youth who are interested in conservation and help them pursue not just a dream job, but a dream career. Thank you for giving me the time to share my story. I hope that you can continue to support individuals like me. Thank you so much for your testimony. You did a great job, let me say. We are ple pleased to have you. Any questions for any of the testifiers? Uh, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm just curious, was this funded in the last biennium? To Ms. Nolder. Mr. Chair and Senator Housley, I'm currently looking um, to see which committee it might have been funded under. Um, under the jobs jurisdiction, there wasn't a specific line item. So it, it, I, I don't know if it was from this. Yeah, it could have been a competitive grant. So we will certainly take a look at that, unless the, uh, the testifier knows. Ms. Bolscher. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, it was not funded as a direct appropriation. Um, we competed for the 175000 through a, a deed grant. And previously, it used to be yeah, a lot more. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And when you competed for that grant, did you get it? 
We did to the Chair, justifier. Senator. Yes, um, we we did receive the one hundred seventy five thousand. Thank you. Here's my question. Oh, S Senator Nelson had a question first. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, just a comment to um, the uh, previous student uh, working in in the youth employment and training. I would just say my first paycheck uh, was from working with the community parks and recreation area, and it's remained a very important uh, part of my life too. So I think that's it's great. I just have one question uh, regarding so very uh, very important program does great things for the environment, parks, kids growth, all those things. I have one question though. It also reminds me of uh, something we didn't have in the state where I grew up, which was the Conservation Corps. And I'm wondering about any um, either overlap or working with uh, the Conservation Corps. I don't know if it, it serves the, the same age of students, but that's, an, that's a program that we also fund at the legislature that does a phenomenal job. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could tell me if there's any uh, intersection or uh, with the Conservation Corps? Sure. Ms. Polsher. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, we actually do work with Conservation Corps um, within the Minneapolis Park Board. The program that they do as a partner, as a contractor, is they do a program called Youth Outdoors, Yo. Yeah. And so that's a um, shoulder season program that they run for teenagers. And they usually do that out of North Commons Park in Powderhorn, and it serves maybe eight to 12 kids. And then they work Tuesday, Thursdays, and volunteer activities on Saturdays. And so it's a very small group that um, have an exposure to youth, but their goal too is to like encourage kids to move into Conservation Corps. I've been in conversation with them um, starting last fall to figure out if there was a way that they could have their crews work with us over the summer when we have the most kids, and we're trying to have our kids work like as you were hearing, in more natural spaces, be in the parks more, because that helps achieve some of those goals that are out there for getting more kids immersed in nature. But they've got the skill set, and so the Conservation Corps team could potentially work with our kids and be kind of teenagers, and be kind of the co-leads out in the field that they would have that skill set. And it's more people to say, oh, this is chain, not that our kids are going to use chainsaws, but you know, here are some additional skills that you have to learn. And again, um, most of Conservation Corps are college students, so you actually most of them that work with us are already in college or have just graduated and are trying to figure out what to do next. So it's kind of a stepped up. Most of our youth are 14 to like 17, and then we have a smaller amount that are like more like 18 to 22. Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you. Thank you for that. I wondered if there was an age difference, but again, there's a great, uh, great ability there, to, uh, great synergy there. And I'm glad to hear that you are looking at how to work that synergy together or as, as students leave your program, uh, getting connected with Conservation Corps. So uh, thank you. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again for coming. It sounds like such a great program. Um, I'm just curious if it was 175 in the last biennium and you're asking for 750 um, this one, uh, and I know you said that would go for more opportunities for, for youth to come back again and again, but can you kind of give me a little bit of a breakdown of what that 750000 would be? Ms. Posher. Mr. Chair, Senator, so the 750000 would pay for 130 youth, their supervisors, transportation, um, the education leads, and the tools and equipment. And the 175 that we have currently is kind of covers some of the, like the base, what we do all of the time. This is to hire additional youth. When we put out, I'll just say in previous years, when we used to open it up to everybody to apply, we would get somewhere between 800 and 1,000 applications. And so we no longer put out a public ask anymore. We really do direct recruiting. Um, and focus on that because it just it just feels terrible to have kids turn in the application and have to say no. And so we really hire maybe about 190 youth between deed funding and what we have from Minneapolis taxpayers directly um, in order to make that happen. So um, this enables us to say yes to more teenagers and young adults. And it, um, I would say too, like the number of youth that we had served, my goal is really to have more young adults because I really see the need within the Minneapolis parks and um, our partners like at Public Works with City of Minneapolis. We both have major gaps um, in jobs that we need that our, our program provides training to get you ready to go and do and fill that. So um, the exact breakdown is gonna vary a little bit in terms but of like if we have 
older youth, young adults, you have to pay them a little bit more than teenagers, not the training wage, which we do for 14 and 15 year olds, which is like 12, 80, one an hour versus um, once you're, you've worked 90 days, then you get regular minimum wage, with, which within Minneapolis is uh, 15, 19, that's $15 and 19 cents an hour. But then I think when you get into like, hey, I'm 18, 19, 20, you're not really gonna work for $15 an hour. So we have to pay them a little more in the site supervisors as well. So um, that's the route we're going. Does that help or would you like something more? So Mr. Now, Chair, no, that's great, thank you. So I'm not quite sure if I heard you correctly. You said currently with the 175, you employ roughly 130 youth. And if, and, and if I'm right or wrong about that, let me know that. So it's a series of questions that I have sure. based on this. So you can correct me if I'm wrong about the 130, uh, or let me know exactly how many youth are you looking at employing with this increase? Because if, if that 130 was based on the 175, then I just want to kind of understand that. You also said that this increase will help you increase wages for your young people. Let me, uh, give me a sense of what are the wages or arranged now, and what will they go to? Uh, and you said youth supervisors. How many supervisors are we talking about? And what is the range of wages now, and what will it go to? Uh, and uh, that would be helpful. Uh, Ms. Posher. Mr. Chair, I may, I may not get them all right away, but I will <laughs> try to follow through. So um, let's see. The number of youth is not, we do not get 130 youth for $175,000. It usually caught, we usually have eight to 10 kids, teenagers per crew, and there is one adult site supervisor who is with them at all times. And then we have, in addition to that, they're called crew, I would guess I would call them the site coordinators, and they each take half the city. And those coordinators then are running probably six to seven crews of teenagers who are out working in the park system. So, um, this 70, 750,000 at 100, it's like another 13 crews of kids, teenagers, plus 13 site supervisors, plus some of the, um, we may need an additional site coordinator just to like kind of keep things moving because it's a lot of parks to move a lot of kids through and make sure they all have meaningful work 28 hours a week, so four days a week for nine weeks for the summer program. So um, there's definitely more staff, and I will say we, we recruit really hard to make sure that the site supervisors are reflective of the teenagers that they serve. The wages that we've had um, for site supervisors had been $16 an hour, and so we've been trying to increase that. So um, last year they were getting paid 18, and I'm hoping we can go more to like 20 or 22 because these are adults for supervisors. A lot of them work for uh, Minneapolis Public Schools, St. Paul Public Schools during the school year, but their heart is for teenagers, so they are really trying to like come back and continue to give and be mentors for youth. They are mostly men that come back and do this role. I would say 55 to 60 percent of the teens that we employ and young adults are young men. Um, so that's the goal there is to raise that wage. And then to, um, I'm really hoping that for like, again, older youth, I will just say it flat out, our competition is Target. It is um, Home Depot, um, and those are very different jobs where you can start at $16, $17 an hour. You can choose when you want to work. It's indoors, it's air conditioned, and it's not labor outside in the sun. So that's who we're competing with in order to get teenagers to work as well. But we're great because we're embedded in your neighborhood. You can walk to work. So um, let's see, did I hit all of those? <laughs> did I, I miss? I think you do it again. <laughs> I think we could come back if there's something else. Senator Drahan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for bringing this bill forward um, and uh, the great discussion we're having, members. I, my, my question kind of stems on the million and a half dollars you're requesting over the next two years and um, kind of what piece of the pie is that million and a half going to cover? Is it going to cover all the expenses or are the regional parks paying some? The city of Minneapolis, I, I, I know the Minneapolis Park Board is quite expansive, mm -hmm. and I think you employ a couple thousand people over part-time and full-time, but can you just, how big a pie are you asking the state to cover? Sure. Uh, uh, Ms. Pulsher. <laughs> 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, out of the youth employment, like overall, what we would be doing if we had the, and I'm going to go annually because I don't, but I would say this, adding that 750000 in with what we put in now is probably um, about half. Because we have about, yeah, I would say it's about half. So it's a, it's a big increase in the number of youth that we would be able to serve. Follow up, Senator Hamill, are you okay? All right, here's my question. It's my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that young people who are looking to be a part of your, your program has to go through a background check. And it's my understanding that anything on their record, whether they're a juvenile and they may have had some things going on, they are prohibited from working for uh, the park board in, on these jobs. Is that true? Uh, Mr. Chair, I could dig in more closely with HR, but we're looking for very specific things. It's only of the person, at the child, because there's been some misconception for um, families that the whole family is background checked, so we do make sure families that we know that they're not, the adults are not being looked at. Um, we actually give kids second and third chances. We have another program that's called Envision Your Future, which actually works with a small number of kids to actually figure out how to get your record expunged and move you forward. So, um, But are they able to work for? They have worked for us through the Imagine Your Future program. Which is a totally different program. But it's, yeah, and at that, we're not requesting money for that, but it definitely, in terms of youth employment. So for but, this, So this program, they're not able to work for this program? I would have to get the list of what it is, but it's more like a felony or, or something like that, I think. I would have to go and actually check. I can get that for you and let you know, but it's for, as long as I've been involved with this, we haven't really turned kids away. Um, so it's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to get that information, and if you could supply that with, with a letter. Yep, because I can do that. Because our understanding is that young people who may have a blemish on their record because of being in anything with the juvenile issue are prohibited. And I see, uh, I'm not certain if Mr. Rice wants to come and speak to this question. Chair Champion, uh, Pamela Gokemeyer with the Minneapolis Park Board. I do intergovernmental work. And this question was raised earlier, and my understanding from speaking with HR is the only prohibition is a felony, but no, no low-level low offense would prohibit the youth from participating in the program. Thank you so much. So if you can make sure that you get that to us in writing, because that's one of the, the things that we've heard around the table and one of the things that is of concern to us as well. Uh, because we want to make sure that young people are working and, and we want to see how we can make sure that there's a pathway to do that. So thank you so much for your testimony. And with that, uh, members, uh, this bill would be laid over for possible inclusion. But before I do that, any last uh, words, uh, Senator Fate? Uh, no, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity uh, for this, Mr. Chair. We heard from our testifier the uh, <coughs> impact it's had on her life. Um, and I think it's a good bill. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And with that, Senate file uh, 400 is laid on the table for possible inclusion. Now we are going to Senator Muhammad. We, now before the committee is going to be Senate file 559. And our vice chair, who would then just become senator, instead of me calling her vice chair, she's going to the testifier's table. And it's my understanding, Senator, as soon as you uh, are seated, Senator Muhammad, you can give your opening uh, uh, words. And then I think you have one testifier, which would be uh, Kathy Matter, if my memory serves me correctly. Actually, I'm reading this, so I'm not relying on my memory, really. Uh, Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and thank you for hearing uh, this legislation. This is Senate File 559, an appropriation of $1.3 million over two years. Um, to Aviva Villages. Aviva is a full-spectrum indoor housing facility that includes chemical dependency, mental health, and physical health services. They help, well, uh, they help with well-being through recovery and career advan advancement while working to end homelessness. Um, Aviva has a, u uh, has a unique model that provides privacy for residents and families by providing tiny homes which are housed inside, um, inside a larger heated facility. 
Their spaces are safe, inclusive, and culturally competent for residents, members, and community members as well. They've helped thousands of communities, uh, community members achieve recovery, uh, recovery, employment, and economic advancement through their programs. Um, Aviva has, is located in Minneapolis, but they have locations in Bloomington, Brooklyn Center, Burnsville, Roseville, um, and St. Cloud, West St. Paul as well. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Uh, now we'll turn to you to testify if that's okay. That's right. Uh, Ms. Matters. Yes. Ms. Matter, not matters, Ms. Matter. Uh, uh, identify yourself for the record and please go forward with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Champion, members of the committee, and Senator Muhammad for uh, being the chief author of our bill. For the record, my name is Kelly Matter. I'm the president and CEO of Avivo. Um, I'd first off like to just express my sincere thanks and deep gratitude for the support Avivo has been provided for our hard and important mission and work in the community of um, enhancing well-being through recovery and career advancement while working to end homelessness. Today I'm, I'm here to talk about our career advancement programming and the impact it has on individuals served as well as uh, our business community. Uh, Avivo is a 60-year-old organization. We serve about 11,000 people annually. We pro provide emergency shelter and housing support, chem chemical and mental health treatment and support, career training directly with and for over 200 business partners. We help about 3,000 people go to work each year and about 2,000 people move from MFIP or welfare or public assistance to um, sustainable work. Um, we're here because we serve people that experience multiple, multiple systemic barriers to education, employment, and well-being. Individuals we serve experience, experience homelessness, joblessness, hopelessness, long-term extreme poverty, long histories of uh, trauma, incarceration, long-term reliance on public assistance, illness, disabilities, and other barriers. You know, we really focus on being exclusively inclusive in our work, and we believe that everyone that wants to work can work. Um, every day I'm inspired by the people that we see that come to Avivo to s make a significant change in their life and choose a different path, a path towards success, whatever that may mean for them. Many times that is gaining uh, housing, gaining sobriety, going back to school, finding a new job or a whole new career. Um, we're proud of the outcomes that we have achieved with your support and the support of our communities. Um, and we are seeking 650000 in fiscal year 2020. 24 and 650,000 in fiscal year 2025 from the general fund to the Commissioner of Employment and Economic Development for the Avivo Institute for Career and Technical Education. We are seeking that so that we can have greater impact um, in improving the, the earning potential and economic stability of people that we serve that have primarily a chemical addiction, are experiencing homelessness, and have a serious mental illness. Um, training and employment are important, important to the recovery journey, and we want to create an opportunity and a pathway for people who are struggling the most that aren't an obvious and natural fit for traditional career pathways programs. It takes more intensive work. It takes longer work. It takes longer than a year. Uh, we stick with people very, very long term to take that first step, which might mean shelter, and then the next best, best step from there that ultimately does mean advanced education and employment at a living wage job. And at a time where we heard from our demographer that the state of Minnesota needs every uh, single worker available to them. And Avivo is not going to give up on anyone. Um, so I did have a testifier, um, a gentleman by the name of Charlie Price, who is working today, and he thought he could take time from work and join us. And uh, we've been waiting for him to show up on Zoom this entire time, and something must have come, at, come up at work. He's, very, he's a reliable worker first, and I'm, he's uh, committed to employment. But Charlie uh, did go through addiction treatment. Uh, he attended a Vivo 16-week IT training program, and he is now working in health, health desk support for Best Buy. He has a, a livable wage job that he is able to, uh, you know, live independently and sustain himself for, for the very first time. And I wish you could hear from Charlie because he does a much better job than I do in, in, in sharing his story. But um, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Matter, question. Um, yeah. 
I just want to be clear on the numbers because I know the, mo the money that you are requesting again from us is to provide low-income individuals with career education and job skills training. How many people have you served um, uh, uh, specifically in that area of ca career education and job skills training? I, well, so over the years, we've served thousands of individuals. Prior to the pandemic, we were serving about 800 people per year that were graduating from the Avivo Institute. That we that has downsized over the last couple of years. Our goal is to serve uh, 200 people in the Avivo Institute uh, this next year. And and what did you serve last year? Even though the number went down, and I know that you say that you want to do 200. What was the number? Last year, we served approximately 150 individuals. In our St. Cloud, between our St. Cloud and our in our Minneapolis location. Any other questions for the testifier, Ms. Nelson, uh, Senator Nelson? Just a brief question on the uh, funding source. I thought this sounded like workforce development funding. Maybe that's where it's been funded before. But I noticed in uh, your bill today, uh, Senator Mohammed, that you're seeking a general fund appropriation direct general fund appropriation instead of going through the WDF. Can you, why, why the change in funding, funding source? Uh, uh, to the testifier, uh, Ms. Matter, um, or, 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 uh, or Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Nelson. I'm actually gonna ask Fiscal to help me out with that answer. Ms. Nomner. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the Avivo appropriation in the past has been workforce development. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure why it might be general fund or, or workforce development fund. I think it's a preference of, of the author. Um, so I guess I, I don't have much else there for you, but in the past it has been uh, funded by workforce development fund. Uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on the jobs committee, and I just cannot recall uh, the workforce development fund, or even what it is now today. Uh, are those competitive um, proposals? And uh, you know, I'm just wondering about the difference between a general fund, which is a direct appropriation just to this particular entity, which sounds very worthwhile, but uh, I, is the workforce development fund um, Competitive proposals. I want to know if we're ex if we're moving it from a competitive proposal to a statutory. So just so you know, and then Ms. Nomer can Noner can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but workforce development funds uh, it is at the pleasure of the chair how and this committee obviously if we want a program to be funded out of the workforce development fund versus general fund. Uh, it's my understanding that when it comes out of the workforce development fund, it doesn't go against your target. So uh, sometimes what, what people will do, or chairs would do, in order to have a little more lead way, they will, will uh, fund some things out of the general fund and then also out of the workforce development fund. Thank you. So now with that being said, Senator Dre Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and I was gonna say the same thing you just said. Um, but I, I, I think you guys do great work. I, Senator Mohammed, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, I guess my, my question was um, kind of along the lines that Senator Nelson was going. What other funds do you receive from the state? And then what is your other main uh, funding source? Yeah. Ms. Uh, Matter. Sorry. Thank you, Chair and uh, Senator Dreheim. Um, you know, the short answer is our funding comes everything from bake sales to, you know, federal, state, county, and city, and individual giving. So approximately, you know, overall 60% uh, of our revenue is um, uh, earned income uh, through billing, insurance companies, and other sources, and other fee, direct fee for services. Some of those fees for services in the institute do come from the state vocational rehabilitation, where people with disabilities might be referred, and there's an authorization to bill a fee for the training program. And we have a long history of, of that type of fee for service from the state. Um, our desire with this appropriation and with the appropriation in the, pa in the past is to serve individuals, you know, coming directly from Avivo Village, uh, coming from our substance use treatment program that don't, there's not an immediate fit with some of that traditional state and other funding. We want to be exclusively inclusive, if you will, 
with this support. Senator Draham. Thank you. So uh, on, the, on the state side, besides the fee for service, um, is there any other um, state funding that you are currently? Yes, we are part of a Pathways grant with Osseo Public Schools. Um, so we are partnering with Osseo Public Schools right now to serve transition age students. Um, we have a seven module um, high tech training program that are stackable credentials that young people can earn one or up to the seven credentials um, to get into the uh, most of them are going to work for Comcast and fiber optics. I start to lose my, <laughs> my technical knowledge on this. But that is a, I think it's approximately $200,000 state career pathways grant. Senator Johan, thank you. So it appears that uh, if we do the math, that the $1.2 million that you're asking for, if you're going to serve roughly 150 to 200, then it, it, it boils down to like $6,500 per person. Is that about right? You know, I think it would, sorry, Chair uh, uh, Champion. Ms. Matter. It, it would be cut in half. You know, we would serve 200 per year, so it would be about 3,200 cost per student served. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense to me, um, as, as it pertains to the numbers. So anything else? If nothing else, thank you so very much. We thank appreciate you. your testimony. Any last words, uh, Senator Muhammad? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you so very much. The uh, Senate file uh, 559 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. You know, they say timing is everything. And it's so uh, exciting to know that Senator Pappas is with us, and she walked in right in the nick of time. So before the committee is Senate file 325, and we're going to ask Senator Pappas to come forward and talk about the Centers of Independent Living Grants Appropriation that she is requesting. So with your opening statements, then you can introduce your testifier, Senator Pappas. Welcome to the Jobs Committee, Senator Pappas. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I'm, on an, I'm in another committee, and I had another bill up, so I really appreciate you putting me at the end of the agenda and me running over from the Capitol in time to be here. Um, I'm pleased today to present Senate File 325 for direly needed funding for Centers for Independent Living. There are eight centers for independent living in Minnesota who serve, serve people of every type of disability from birth to death. These organizations are statutory and provide a wide array of services and supports that create the reality for people with disabilities to live independently. Due to the high volume of individuals they relocate out of nursing homes and the vast amount they prevent from having to go to a higher cost institution, they save the state of Minnesota nearly $100 million in Medicaid savings. Despite the critical role Centers for Independent Living play, they're, they're really underfunded and have not had a substantial increase in funding in over 15 years. A study conducted over six years ago found that the centers need at least $18 million to fully serve the state. We are seeking $9 million to get them halfway to a functional operational capacity. And Mr. Chairman, um, I have with me a couple testifiers, including Ms. Uh, Cara Ruff, who will start. So thank you, Senator Pappas. So Cara Ruff is my understanding. Uh, say your name for the record. And also, I understand that you're the executive director of Independent Lifestyles. Yes. So if you could uh, tell us the name uh, and go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I'm Kara Ruff. I am the Executive Director for Independent Lifestyles, a Center for Independent Living uh, in Sauk Rapids. Uh, Senator Putnam is my, I'm his constituent as I live in St. Cloud. Uh, and I'm also the legislative liaison for the Minnesota Association of Centers for Independent Living, which are comprised of the eight centers um, across the state of Minnesota. We're here today to ask for your urgent assistance with Senate File 325, which seeks $9 million to be added to the base for the eight center for Centers for Independent Living in Minnesota. Centers for Independent Living are statutory nonprofit organizations, and by providing $9 million, you're helping to fulfill the statutory work that we're required to do by state law. Sadly, the issue of people with disabilities over the years has taken a back burner in our society except, of course, for the approximately 15 to 20% of our population who has one or more disability. 
As I share more information, I respectfully ask you to consider a few scenarios so you can better understand what it is that Centers for Independent Living do. One scenario, you leave here today and sadly have a car accident and you learn you'll never walk again. You'll need to relearn all activities of daily living. You can't even go home because your home is not accessible. You have no idea how to access benefits or resources and you fall into a deep depression, unable to cope with your new disability. You're unable to work. Your marriage falls apart and you've lost your will to live. Another scenario, your child is born with developmental disabilities and must someday learn to live on their own uh, or they'll become institutionalized. Another scenario, your brother served proudly in the military only to come back with PTSD and such extreme anxiety that he is unable to function daily. He becomes homeless and needs help with all daily living tasks. Another scenario, your cousin obtained a traumatic brain injury removing ice from the roof. In order to live on his own, he needs to learn how to cook, clean, pay bills, communicate effectively, utilize transportation, and needs home modifications in order to live in his own home. Next week, you suffer a stroke and you can no longer take care of yourself. You need in-home personal care, you need help managing your money, and with daily living skills. Your friends have faded away and you are on your own. Another scenario, your neighbor develops a mental illness and becomes homeless and loses her ability to carry out daily living skills effectively. She needs help with daily living, paying bills, finding housing, utilizing transportation, accessing, accessing benefits, establishing supports, and has no one to help her. Lastly, you have, an ep you have epilepsy and your aging parents can no longer take care of you. You've never really lived on your own and have no idea where to even begin. You've never been allowed to make decisions for yourself. So although you only need help in managing your money and benefits, you go along with the social worker who places you in a group home instead of realizing your dream of independence. I can assure you if any of these scenarios were to befall you or your loved ones, you would want a Center for Independent Living in your area that is fully functioning and can meet the needs of those you care about. These are just a few of the scenarios that Centers for Independent Living work with every single day. Centers are a one-stop shop. We provide independent living skills training, accessibility services, peer mentoring, information and referral, advocacy, socialization and supports across the state, and much, much more. We are consumer controlled, so that means 51% of our board and staff must be people with disabilities so that we're truly governed by, the, by those we serve. And that also means we have a responsibility to be responsive to our own regions and communities. So among the eight, services can look very different. Um, I've spent my whole career in a Center for Independent Living the past 30 years because it's a model that works. It's a model that truly works and empowers people to live their best lives. One thing that was going on in, in the St. Cloud Central Minnesota area uh, 25 years ago, people were losing their Social Security benefits because they couldn't even find a responsible representative payee. So their benefits would be cut off and they'd lose their housing and, you know, the rest. So we... we took that upon ourselves without any funding and said, okay, we'll do representative pay services. And today we do that for over 900 individuals and that just one service alone that keeps them all living independently versus going to a higher cost institution. Among the state, there are many diverse and unique programs that each center offers, including uh, ramp and, and resources and computer and technology and all kinds of things. Centers for Independent Living are community-based, consumer-controlled, non-residential, and non-profit organizations that serve every type of disability from birth to death. Um, there's no other service model like it. So whether someone has a physical, cognitive, mental, emotional, chemical, sensory disability, they're qualified for services um, and from birth to death. There's no other model like that. For the past three decades, eight Centers for Independent Living have been asked to provide services to people of all disabilities and all ages throughout Minnesota with between one to three million dollars. We have also been given a fifth mandated service to provide also without additional funding. Again, not just one type of disability, but all from mild to severe from birth to death in every county in Minnesota. As Senator uh, Pappas said, an independent study conducted six years ago showed that we need at least 18.2 million to adequately serve the state. 
We're currently at 3.1 million for eight centers for independent living. Now we know that you have many tough issues and decisions that you're gonna have to make. We're begging you to give this issue the justice and consideration that is desperately needed. People with disabilities constitute the nation's largest minority group and the only group any one of us can join at any time. Between 15 to 20% of Minnesotans have a disability and 24% of veterans have a disability. That's around 600,000 Minnesotans with disabilities and nearly 220 who live with a serious mental health condition. 44% of people with a disability say they're not being allowed to live independently in, in line with their own choices. That's staggering. We heard, we heard reports on the demographics about all different minority populations except people with disabilities wasn't included in there. As of 2020, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities was 17.7. But if 44% of any other minority population were told they couldn't live how and where they choose, I think there would be unending outcries and rebellion. We urge you to give this attention that it deserves. Historically, we further segregated and marginalized people with disabilities with sub-minimum wage employment, group homes, institutions, and other indignities against their will. But what is truly baffling is that all of those options cost significantly more than Centers for Independent Living at a fraction of the cost, and they actually empower people to live with dignity and choice and respect. Unlike any other service model, we provide services and supports in all areas of life that are consumer controlled. We bring services to the most remote, uh, pop, most remote areas to the most populated parts of our state. Even during the pandemic, <coughs> Centers for Independent Living stayed on the front lines, ensuring people with disabilities were not abandoned and provided the supports and services that were critical. In over the past year alone, we've served over 7,000 individuals. We relocated 697 individuals out of nursing homes or institutions and prevented the necessity for another 1,303 with our services. For those we relocated, we collectively saved the state of Minnesota a minimum of 68 million in Medicaid funds. There are still thousands of individuals across our state desperately waiting for these services. There are thousands of Minnesotans who can live independently with just some minimal basic community supports from Centers for Independent Living. We can restore dignity and choice and save Minnesota millions and millions of dollars. I honestly can't imagine a bigger win-win for the state of Minnesota and for people with disabilities. We're asking the legislature to fund what clearly is cost-effective and produces real results. To look at the facts, we bring individuals from dependency to independence, assisting them in obtaining education, homes, parenting skills, skills to live on their own, employment, financial stability, advocacy, and so much more. This is a critical issue and we have been waiting decades for the help we need. We're not here just because suddenly there's a surplus. We've been, we've been here every year asking for the help that we need. This is a dire situation in our state and we're here with a solution that saves taxpayers millions of dollars and produces real results. We ask that you give people with disabilities the respect and attention they deserve by funding what actually works. And Ms. Ruff, are you almost finished? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm done. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we really do get to point. I have a couple questions for you. It is my understanding that there are eight um, uh, centers for independent living across the state. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and, 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 um, and right now you all are receiving roughly uh, $3 million a year? That, yeah, that's divided evenly among the eight. And so, um, so are you uh, asking for a, an additional $12 million over the, bi $12 million over the biennium? Uh, um, is that still for the same eight uh, facilities? And if so, what will the increased amount be for each um, entity uh, if you were to get this, this increased allocation? The allocation, Mr. Chair, would be divided equally among the eight centers for independent living, whatever that allocation might be. Um, and, and then my uh, next question is, um, how many people do you currently serve uh, annually uh, with, the, uh, with the allocation that you receive now? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, currently last year we served a little over 7,000 people across the state. So across the state, when, when you say across the state, it, through those eight uh, Through centers, the eight, yep. Right? The eight centers for independent living are located in these geographic regions. You can see on the scatter map where the services were more heavily performed and then the big gaping holes where they are lacking significantly. And um, so you don't make any difference between if one gets more or less based on um, population need, or, or, or are you saying that 7,000 number that you are uh, uh, giving us is equally divided amongst those eight, and so that gives us a, a sense as to how many uh, folks are served in that area. So it would be roughly a little over um, uh, 1,000 people per independent uh, uh, living space. Is that right? Mr. Chair, it, it's not an equal distribution, and we've had this discussion for years because there's no simple or easy answer. When we're working out state, and you can see these large geographic regions, our travel budgets are insane. We're covering nine to 11 counties. So just to get people out to these communities and in homes is really expensive. Satellite offices are really expensive. So we've had to close some of those. Some of the centers have had to close theirs due to lack of funding. Um, and then you have the metro area where we have the greater population and in central Minnesota, the greater population area. So um, at this point, uh, according to the state, it is divided equally. And, you know, we're open to looking that at again. Again, it's been a discussion point for many years. Any other questions for the testifiers? Any questions for the testifiers? Uh, comments, Senator Nelson. Oh, lost, lost the mic here. Here. All right. Uh, I just wanted to state that um, uh, the part of the state where I uh, come from and represent, SimCell. Uh, and I would just say SimCell has a great reputation. They have done remarkable, remarkable things. Uh, I know some of the, the young people who have benefited. The parents have talked to me. Uh, the adults. I mean, it really does a, a really great job of helping all Minnesotans live their best lives. And that's what we should be about. So I appreciate the work you do. And I did want to just note that the um, one of our former SimCell um, employees is now a state representative. And so uh, that would be Representative Kim Hicks over in the House. Yes. So yes. you will have, hopefully she's your author over there. She'll have a great representation. But anyway, just wanted to say thank you for the work you do. If nothing else, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I echo what Senator Nelson said, and thank you, Senator Pappas, for letting me be on this bill with you. I have visited the um, Metropolitan Center for the Independent Living across from Lunds. Um, loved it. Love what you guys do there, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Any additional questions before we lay, lay this bill over for, for possible inclusion? And I'd like to Mr. say... Mr. Testifier. Oh, yes. I'm a testifier. <laughs> I'm Carol LaFleur from Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. First and foremost, I want all of you to know we are, even though it's a Senate file number, we are a name, not a number. We are individuals with disabilities that need services. We also have goals, dreams, and aspirations just like everybody else in this room. That being said, from 1990 to 1997, the state of Minnesota spent a lot of money on me in two state hospitals, every psychiatric unit in the state of Minnesota, two nursing homes, and a group home. I was sent home in 1997 to die. They said I would die. I was full time in a wheelchair. I was unable to walk on my own, unable to dress myself. I weighed 62 pounds. I was finally given resources through the county a little bit later on. I had become homebound, unable to leave my home unless it was by ambulance. I was set up with the Metropolitan Center with Independent Living, was get, got staffing and resources. Due to those things, I stopped going to the hospital by ambulance. I stopped utilizing those other services. I was able to leave my home and get social skills without anxiety and panic attacks. I went to Metro North Hennepin Community College where I graduated in 2011, and I went on to get my bachelor's degree from Metropolitan State University in 2014, and I was summa cum laude and class speaker. Where do I work now? I work. I don't get any county assistance. I don't get any social security, and I pay taxes just like everyone else. I work at Metro Transit Police Department where I've been for the last eight years. And that is something that is priceless. You gave me, they gave me my life back, and finances give people their life back. I live independently in my home. I care for my children. And guess what? When you change my life, my kids who happen to have disabilities, their lives have been changed, and guess what? They all work. 
this money is important. Because now for me at my job, what do I do? I work on the homeless action team. I work with our clients that are on our trains and our buses. I am our community outreach coordinator. I am our Native American liaison because I'm a descendant of Malax band of Ojibwe. I just want you to know how important this is because my kids have their mom because there was money there to provide me services. And Senator Champion, Chair, you've known me for a lot of years. I've come a long way to be where I am and you've always supported me. And I, you know me as well. I hope each and every one of you understand how important this is and support this because without this, I wouldn't be where I am today because guess what? My next step was to kill myself. But I'm alive because I got services. And so I want you guys to really think about that. Each of our stories are unique to who we are, but there's more than my story out there. And you know what? To be successful and to be able to do my passion and dream and the work that I do today, how awesome is that, right? So if we go back and take 1990 and 97 and add up how much money we put into me where I didn't get the services I needed and then went to that and looked at the amount of money that was put there, which was less, and look where I am today. And the wheelchair... 15 years later, my staff member, Amanda, helped me get out of that that's wheelchair. But you know Amanda Caps, and she was a PC for me for many, many years. And I walk on my own now, I drive on my own now, I work on my own now. All those things that were taken away are now given back to me. And yes, my hand's going down because this is such an important topic to me. And we need so, we, people need to be known for whom they are and given those goals, dreams, and aspirations just like everybody in this room. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wasn't trying to cut you off there from, from your testifying. I got a list that tells me who is supposed to testify today. So let me pause a second before your three-minute video so we can get to your three-minute video. And after the video, we'll give the last word to Senator Pappas. So anyone else going to testify there? Okay. Seeing no one else, let's go to the video. And while they're uploading that video, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if I should be nice to Carol LaFleur or not because she works for Metro Transit and they had me do, do, do this rodeo oh, oh, where, oh, where I had to drive a bus. <laughs> I had to drive a bus through a parking lot. And, and you should have seen them all running when I got behind the wheel. <laughs> but, I, but he fails to say he won. I won, though. <laughs> he all right. the so, so the three-minute video. Mr. Chair, this is Corporal John Schneider from Bemidji. My name is John Schneider, Chair and Committee Members. I want to tell you a story. I was homeless. I was living in a hunting blind, eating squirrels in the wilderness. I served honorably in the Marines for 10 years. I was trained as a sniper. When I got out, I had a hard time transitioning into civilian life. I did not have the skills to live independently with my disability. I was struggling with PTSD and undiagnosed epilepsy at the time. Then one day, I got a phone call from some guy who said he was from a center for independent living. He wanted to know if he could help, if I could come into the office and talk. I met with him. This was about the time I was at the end of my rope. I had no faith in the system or myself any longer. He wanted to know what my needs and issues were. When an individual is continuously given handouts, he tends to lose the ability to help himself. The first thing we accomplished was housing. I got into my own apartment and qualified for energy assistance, donated furnishings, kitchen items, and some cooking skills. Over time, I learned to advocate for myself, to get medical treatment, and file for Social Security Disability. The Marine Corps taught me the skills to save my life. The Minnesota Center for Independent Living taught me the skills to live my life. The most important thing, I got my family back. My son lives with me. And my mother is again proud of me. I once again respect myself. Now, I'm in college pursuing a bachelor's degree in engineering. I currently have a 4.0 GPA. I speak on the dangers of drugs and alcohol to minors and the community. I moved into a house 
and now own a reliable vehicle. I have the honor of leading my tribe's ceremonial traditions as the Eagle Staff Carrier. I have also been promoted to Chaplain of the American Legion post-2018. I consider myself a productive member of society once again. I owe Access North a deep debt of gratitude. I had a huge mountain of issues to overcome, and the Center for Independent Living broke the overwhelming mountain down into achievable small steps that I can manage. I want to thank this committee and the Center for Independent Living for being here today. Thank you. If you all could give John Snyder our uh, gratitude and, and tell him thank you for his kind words and his informative words, we really and sincerely appreciate it. Um, any questions for the testifier before I go to Senator Pappas? Pappas? <coughs> Senator Hurt? Yes, I just appreciate uh, Carol, right? Testimony. And thank you. also corporate. Oh, uh, will you speak more in your mic, sir? Oh, okay. I just pre. Oh, this is just to cover. Uh, <laughs> well, the cover is important. <laughs> I know about technology. <laughs> um, Carol, uh, yeah, thank you for your story and also corporate too. But it, I think that's, you know, the highlight of my day hearing your story. You know, you've been through a lot and thank you for contributing back in massive amount. And you know, thank you. Thank you, sir. She is a resilient one, I, will, I might add. She is a resilient one. Senator Pappas, we'll give you the last words before we lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Mr. Chairman, the witnesses have been so eloquent that I don't think I can top them. I just hope that this will be under your consideration. I did, um, I did mention to Kara that they do get private money, they, but they have to go out and fundraise for that. Um, so because this is a statutory requirement, these centers... I think it's important that we take more responsibility for supporting them. With that being said, members, uh, we will lay, lay Senate File 325 over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Now, members, uh, that is all for the week. You should have received in the mail or in your email uh, information for, our, for <laughs> next week's hearings. If you have any questions, let, let us know. Uh, and we are taking bills as fast as we get them in order to make sure that they're able to come before this committee as well. Uh, and I did talk to Senator Dreheim about some of the bills we asked for fiscal notes so that we can always make sure that we're constantly in the uh, habit of requesting those fiscal notes so that you have all available information to you. Any questions before we get ready to go? Seeing none, the committee is adjourned.